Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, hey. Uh, hey, hey uh, sorry. dude. Mohammed, how's it going? Wa alaikum assalam. Not bad, Akhi. Not bad at all. Mohammed, do you remember last week when we had that crazy influx of uh, bots? Guess what? We didn't. Uh, we, didn't we got. We haven't uh, sorted the moderators out yet. We actually did, did get some amazing emails that we're planning to give out to, oh, but wow. we didn't sort it out. So um, if the uh, far right extremists want to um, uh, jump on again and just completely turn this thing around, sadly we'll, they we'll, might have we'll the give option. Them, we'll give them Dawa. Isn't that the, I don't know, they seem like the, bots. The Nasheed goes. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> uh, I uh, there's a there's a person who said I just took Shah- I, know, I took Shahada on the first of the year, and due to a uh, highly abusive relationship, it got a bit deep. So I'm gonna read that a bit later because I should read comments first before reading them out. You know, you know, uh, Mohammed. How about this to get started on Dad's Junior episode five? Fatherly. Uh, dot something. Fatherly. dot com. An article uh, from fatherly.com to start off uh, this episode of Dad's Dunya. And it talks about the science of dad and the father effect. So I'm going to read you the father effect. I'm going to speed read the first bit. So, so it just talks about different, different types of uh, dynamics that the mother and father bring. When children have a close relationship with father figures, they tend to avoid high-risk behaviours and they're less likely to have sex at a young age. I should read these articles before we do this. Yeah. Let's keep reading. Whoa, whoa. The... Less, no, no. <laughs> Was that less likely or more likely? No, less likely. They're, if they're, they tend oh, to, uh, good, father, they're less likely. So uh, they're more likely to have high paying jobs and healthy, stable relationships when they grow up. They also tend to have higher IQ tests by the age of three and endure fewer psychological problems throughout their lives when fatherhood is taken seriously. When fathers are actively involved with their children, children tend to do better, explains Paul Amoto, a sociologist who studies parent child relationships at Pennsylvania State University. Research suggests that fathers are important for a child's development. To a man holding his to a man holding his baby, that may seem like a given. But strange as it may sound, fatherhood is an emerging field of study, and scientists are making up for lost time by finally releasing conclusive data about fa- the father's effect on his children. So that's why this article is called the father's effect. Okay. Okay. Stay with me here. I'm with you. Uh, ugly divorces aren't great for kids and relatively obvious, but others are not. Not everyone would guess. Okay, here we go. The father effect. We're, we're, we're rolling now. Now we're cooking with gas, as they say. The father mm. effect is the umbrella term for the benefits of a paternal presence. Of course, a father's active participation in the family is always preferred. And then the quote says, there needs to be a minimum amount of time spent together, but the quality of time is more important than the quantity of time. And I thought that's something great that we could talk about in today's episode, because you being uh, uh, someone who works in the emergency services probably um, don't get as much time at times with their children. And so you probably really do focus on the quality, whereas Alhamdulillah, I feel like I do especially during this lockdown, I've had a lot of quantity of time, but perhaps I haven't focused as much on the quality. Um, Amato says, just watching television together, for example, isn't going to help much. Fortunately, modern fathers want to be more involved and increasingly society expects more of them. This wasn't always the case. That's why the emerging consensus on the importance of fathers during every stage of a child's development is worth monitoring. Scientists are studying, on some level at least, a new phenomenon. A new phenomenon. Their findings support a conclusion that might change how we parent. And then it kind of just goes into the DNA and just either, uh, sperm and stuff like that. Um, and like the, the DNA balance and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it kind of also goes on this article about how in the, until the 1960s, um, experts uh, didn't really encourage dads to take part in like active, like quality parenting, um, especially at the infant stage. 
Uh, and it was generally understood that dads existed to teach their toddlers to walk and their kids to play catch, not to handle baby stuff. Uh, that was until the 1960s. But then research a few decades later um, suggested that the earlier dads get involved, the better. And um, so some really cool kind of science out of this fatherly.com article that essentially states that fathers uh, having an impact of quality time in their infant's life makes a huge difference and can even lead to a kind of more wholesome uh, adult in the long run. So, uh, and then kind of goes on to explain the relationship between why fathers are important in a daughter's life and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It's an incredibly long article. I'm still scrolling. Uh, but let's focus mm. there uh, on that. So, uh, what they were saying there, Mohammed, was that uh, the quality time you spent as opposed to the quantity of time you spend uh can I impact your child enormously what are your thoughts mm. on that hmm it would be interesting to see what their definition of better and wholesome is you know well it was it was those things it was like um a, a higher iq at the age of three um oh, okay. uh, 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 less likely to have sex at a younger age um, right. All of these different uh, criteria or like mm. markings that they that they ended up having. No, definitely. I think more um, the, the quality is going to be more impactful, and it's going to create stronger memories. Um, if there's something uh, a bit unique about the time you're spending together, something uh, you're doing that is different or extra effort and not mundane, not like they mentioned they're watching just watching TV or watching a movie together or something like that. Um, like a particular game that you're playing together or a particular activity, then yeah, definitely. Um, your, your kid's going to remember that for the rest of their lives. Um, even, you know, even if I, I'd consider maybe that I didn't spend too much quality time with my dad. Um, but there are, there are very, very basic things such as like, I remember um, sitting on my dad's stomach and like jumping up and down. Right. And that, that was just like a specific thing unique to just my me and his relationship that I can remember since, you know, that young tender age up until now. Um, but it was a unique thing. I'm not saying it's the best activity in the world, but it's, the, it's a unique thing that was only solely with him that I would do that. And thus I've remembered that for the rest of my life. Um, but of course, I'm sure you can develop some unique activities that maybe are a bit more engaging, a bit more, um, you know, focused uh, as opposed to like, like we said, the mundane. And yeah, that will stay forever. That will stay forever because um, that that's going to create that bond. That's going to create that sort of um, connection that through ups and downs will always remain and it will always bring you back. Because I think fathers are probably prone to um, having a drift in a relationship somewhat with their kids uh, because they are often the authority figure, the rule makers, the breadwinners. Um, you know the leaders of the household and there is going to be this divergence at some point in a child's age I assume based on my own experience at least of like teenagehood or wanting to do their own thing and maybe being at odds with their father a bit but those memories and those sort of unique sort of frameworks that you've built at an early age can hopefully try and drag that back and, and find a common ground yeah it's interesting you reflect on on the article uh, in terms of your relationship with your father it made me reflect on it on it in terms of my relationship with my son mm. and uh, once i read the article i really felt guilty man i felt guilty because it, of exactly the kind of the, the 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 preface of the article which was that it's not about the quantity of time you spend with your children it's about the quality of time and just simply spending time with them is not enough it made me feel a bit guilty because i struggle to stand still and to stay still and to stay in one place and um for a lot of things i attribute that as a great characteristic and perhaps the characteristic that's allowed me to perhaps flourish in some aspects but uh, that same characteristic has been my detriment perhaps in my relationship with my son because i can't just stay still so when i'm with him i like to do things with him but like that doesn't involve i mean like you know i, just, I like to take him somewhere and i like to um be be busy and 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 so that, but I'm not spending quality time there because I'm busy taking, you know, I'm in the car with him and I'm driving him somewhere and, and then he's busy because he's looking out the window and then, you know, take him to his nan's house and then he's playing with his 
um, family there. But so my idea of like spending time with him is keeping him busy. Like I'm conscious of him getting bored, but that doesn't mean I'm spending actual face to face time, like entertaining him mm -hmm. really. And so that's what worried me about that. And I find myself an impatient man to do that, to do those things. Mm. But that's going to be at my detriment if I, if I, if this article and this science is anything to go by. And it made me think, well, maybe I need to just have that patience. And, and rather than every time I have time with him, try and make sure he's busy and mm. active to try and make sure, yeah, he's busy and active, but with, 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 with me and with, 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 you know, quality, like physically with me and, uh, and so that's made me that's made me reflect on it. You know, t today for example, he was I made him laugh like you know those kind of like belly laughs. I made him yeah. laugh like that for the first time in a while, and that obviously is a great indication to show that they're having fun. And I thought the w all I was doing is I uh, the football that we have his little football. I was I just kept headering it, and um, I would like, make noises as I was headering it. And if I like dropped it, then I'd like pretend to fall over and stuff and he was just loving it he was laughing loving it and that was that quality time that was like me and him i'm like playing with the ball and he's like laughing at how silly i'm being and i don't do mm. that often enough i i really don't i i i busy him too much i i oh like zachary is awake from his nap and he's got four hours come on let's go for a drive let's you know be busy be busy be, be busy to almost like not to kill the time but to make sure that he's not bored because he can get very bored mm. otherwise right in the, in the yeah. house doing the kind of same thing but actually, yeah, I'm, I'm reflecting now, and perhaps that's not the best thing. Perhaps I need to just. I, yeah, I think it's impossible it's to avoid the guilt, bored. bro. Yeah, but think about it like you can. You'll always find areas to be guilty about. I mean, I, I think to myself in the same sort of situation, definitely 100% feel the same way, um, because you just you do get caught up in maybe trying to fulfil. I guess some of your own sort of wishes in the sense of things that you want to do. And I, I, I notice it now more than ever, like I'll sit down to do something that I want to do. And you can tell that the kids want to want your attention to the point where it becomes that they become interested in what you're doing, even though it's nothing to do with kids. Like I could be doing something on the computer, trying to sort something out. And so the man will come like try and sit on my lap and then start asking me about what I'm doing on the computer and start looking at things and pointing out things and stuff, which is totally irrelevant to a child's sort of interests in the sense you know he's surely a, a child would want to watch something you know fun and entertaining on tv or play some sort of game or play with some sort of toys not watch dad look at a spreadsheet or some sort of email on the on the computer but but that's that's obviously them signaling in their own way hey what are you doing i want to be involved i want your attention to the point that i will willingly take an interest in what dad's doing just to get dad's attention and that, yeah, that is a bit. That is a bit of a guilt trip, um, and I, 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 I definitely feel feel your pain there, bro. Because yeah, we are busy. We are running, you know, hundred miles an hour all the time, and um, it's mad that kids have got that energy. And growing up, you never think you'd have you'd have the um, the tiredness that you saw your parents have. I remember growing up, not, yeah. not yeah, I didn't, I couldn't understand why my parents were tired all the time. But now it's like. Suleiman, leave me, please. I need to sleep. Or Suleiman, please, I'm tired. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was just that's. I feel guilty that that's the case, but that is the case, unfortunately. Yeah, and um, it, it's also that attention thing that you speak about is it, so true because they 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 do want your attention a lot, mm. and um, I, and I'm seeing that now a bit more that like it's it's just the attention, the idea of like being in the room and stuff like that, and that's perhaps something that I now need to keep an eye on. And I know you say that, you know, it's it's not right to necessarily feel guilt or, or, or you've got to police that guilt. But <clears throat> it's hard because if I'm being honest with myself, my fear is, is that I am using the excuse that I'm doing these things with him because I don't want him to be bored. But my fear is that maybe I'm doing those things because I don't want to be bored. Like mm -hmm. how, because maybe, cause, cause maybe it is like, quote unquote, boring to, you know, you know, it's that classic thing of you do something that's fun with a kid and you do it for a minute or you do it for five minutes and they they but they don't get enough again again yeah. again 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 yeah, and eventually yeah. like, oh my god my arms are hurting like i can't yeah. keep lifting you or throwing like <laughs> it sounded like i was gonna say throwing you like throwing you up in the air or or whatever yeah, yeah. like keep he even headering this ball like eventually it's boring and um but but and so perhaps me busying him uh by whatever it is is actually 
is actually a weakness of my life. I am actually scared of me being bored. I'm not. I'm, mm. I'm using the excuse that I don't want him to be bored because really, kids don't actually get that. If you you entertain them, you got you. If you put energy into them, they won't get bored. Mm. But it's that energy that's very tiring. It's that energy that can be like leth- like mot- monotonous for you. Uh, you only have so much of it, and mm. so you don't want to give that much energy. And then. Um, yeah, that that's my fear, and I, I think that's true. I think I am being more so. Uh, it's more dangerous because I'm worried about. Uh, it's actually me that's the problem here. It's not. It's not him. It's not actually that he'd get bored. It's very easy to entertain a child, bro. Like you notice it with like their toys. Like you can spend twenty quid, thirty quid on a toy, and you know they, if they're not interested, they just dash it, and you think you feel like oh, I just spent money, hard earned money on that toy, yeah. and you didn't even like it. And then, uh, but then for example, you give them a. You give Zachary like a a box, like a plastic a box with a plastic lid, and he will just play with it for so long. He's like taking lids off and putting lids on, taking lids off and putting lids on. You know, it just goes to show they're not actually concerned about those mm. things. I think it, it, it's uh, thinking about it now. It's I've also got that challenge with two kids. Is that you find yourself because they're that even they're at. They're not that far apart in age, but because of the age they're at now, they are very far apart in ability and interest and activity. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, Suleiman is what, three and a half or so, and he's very active and very aware of what he's doing, very well, what he wants and stuff like that. And Elias is still very much a crawling little toddler baby slash thing that's, you know, in, he's got his interests and stuff, but he's definitely not going to be as fast and as active as Suleiman. But um, what I'm conscious of now is like, I'll give Elias some of that time, you know, that tension that we're just speaking about. And then from the corner of my eye, I'll just look at Suleiman's reaction and he just dives in and wants to get involved as well because it's about like sort of spreading that butter of attention over the toast because you don't want to, you don't want to make one child feel left out uh, just because you're playing with another child in a particular type of way that is more suited to them. You know, I'm still doing the goo goo gaga thing with, with Elias because he's that kind of age. Um, but Suleiman will, will, We'll start doing the same thing, either to to Ilyas to get um, involved with him, and and to be part of this little moment, or he will start intercepting me. So like, I could I could um, you know I could have Ilyas on my lap, for example, you know, bouncing up and down on my lap, and then Suleiman will literally jump on top of me, in between me and Ilyas, even though he's a lot heavier and my legs aren't that strong to do it to both of them, or at least to to, to Suleiman anymore, and it just shows that they just want that attention and they and I don't want to create like a jealousy between them I don't want to create like as soon as I compliment one of them I'm very conscious that I have to compliment the other one on really? something that they're doing yeah very very conscious of that and I don't like I don't like the thought of creating any sort of like feelings of being left out amongst them and I'm, I'm sure you know but if if I have more kids I wish I wish to have more kids but uh, but it's going to be very difficult to spread that across more and more children but you know? I, I read a psychology article that said that that's damaging to children really? because they don't learn um that they don't learn that there's like a, almost a cost to pr- pay for not being um like number one right like so yeah um if they the article specifically mentioned that there's a if uh, that we we've, we've gone into a culture now where children by their parents oh no it wasn't an article it was uh it was it was called oh bro you need to watch this it's called the millennial millennial it's called the millennial problem or the millennial question by simon sinek and i've been talking a lot about simon sinek so to my audience so i do apologize i've been consuming a lot of his content to be honest recently anyway so he's saying that there's this because there's this shift in parenting in 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 the last in his previous generation there's this huge problem with millennials right and it's that you're gonna to have to bear with me here, Mohammed. I'm about to go on a long one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so he says, the sh- "There's been it started with a shift in in parenting, and what the shift in parenting did is that parents were giving their children m- awards for taking part. Essentially, obviously, m- metaphorical, uh, uh, metaphorical awards for taking part. So, um, whereas in the past, like perhaps our parents' parents, if the kid did something." great achieve something great they'd get rewarded in whatever way that means whether that's a a gift a a cuddle um some you know words of uh, encouragement but then the other kids wouldn't necessarily get that and that was healthy is what he was saying that was healthy because then they see that there's this bridge and this difference between uh Mm. just taking part and all and, and winning essentially 
And so he says, in this generation, the millennial generation, what's happened is that um, par- parenting has gone wrong, wrong somewhere, and parents have been giving children a, um, they've been ultra sensitive and giving children an award, essentially, a metaphorical award for taking part. And so what what that's led to is children always feeling like they can, um, like almost like cry or ask for what they want. Like, oh, he's got that, so I want that. He's got um, uh, uh, praise, so I want praise. And because the parent gives it, they grow up like that, right? And then mm. when they're in school, that doesn't really affect their schooling too much. So everything's still fine, right? And then um, what happens is eventually they go and get a job. And when they get a job as a grown adult, for the first time in their life, they realize that um, the world doesn't work like that. Mm. And how the world works is that that guy next to me on the desk next to me has a skill set that's better than my skill set. And he's been promoted or he's got um uh, he's got a, a raise in his pay and i haven't and then uh we find it hard to deal with that the millennial finds it hard to deal with that and then there's this like downward spiral of perhaps it could cause anxiety depression um mm. and and so much more and it can like affect the person's life so negatively and like i said simon sinek he mentions that this starts almost with this like huge shift in parenting that's happened in this generation so he Mm. actually promotes this idea of opposing what you're saying like literally i guess what you're saying is not wrong though you're saying naturally and i agree with you bro like it is a very natural tendency you don't want to show one uh something some love attention and care uh, and not to the other but 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 yeah he's saying that we need to shift back into the old school mindset Mm. that our parents were in and that will like breed success the second point i wanted to make was kind of um leading on uh from that but it was made by another person and uh, this guy, again, it was like one of these motivational speeches. He said that he grew up feeling unloved by his dad. And uh, and he started some, having some resentment with his dad, right, or, for, for, or against his dad, until he finally chose to have that conversation with his dad. Which, again, this the end of this story shows how important it is for parents to con- constantly communicate with their children. So he says that he ended up having a conversation with his dad, and he said, why is it that my brother, my little brother, is always getting the love, the attention? And perhaps this is an example of where the child feels it a lot, and like I said, communication is key. Hmm. And the dad said to the boy... He said, if, um, if your hand, if, if, you're, if one of your hands, like your left hand, is a broken, there's a broken finger on your left hand, yeah, mm. um, would you give the same amount of ten- attention to both of your hands or would you give more attention to your left hand because it's, there's a broken finger on it, right? so right now it needs more attention? And obviously he said, yeah, you'd give more attention to the left and and he said it's like that he said i don't love you any less than i love your brother but right now there's times where your brother may need more attention because for example he's going through difficulty or he's perhaps got a learning disability or something so at that point i have to give more attention to him but it doesn't mean that i love you or him any less mm. um, so i think that again shows the importance of communication there was a lot to uh digest there Mohammed. so i'll hand yeah. it over to you and break down yeah, i mean there's always you know there's there's this is the, the the two sides to every story thing, I guess, because my understanding and why, at least my angle from all of this is that the first is that I wouldn't compliment or encourage on an empty basis. It'd have to be something that's tangible that he may have done or he is doing right now that I can boost his confidence in, right? So I wouldn't just for the sake of it be like, you know, if I'm complimenting something that ADS has done, for example, like something as simple as, oh, he's, he's, he's starting to try and walk from like one side of the table to the sofa or something like that, you know, whilst holding okay. on. Yeah, I'll compliment him on that. And then um, Suleiman might be doing something also in the room, something interesting, whatever, and I'll try and find something that he's doing and boost his confidence in that. That's the first element. The second reason is that although, yes, it, it, it may uh, create some sort of... Uh, lack of competition between them it it also in my opinion admonishes some of the 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 jealousy that may arise between them i'm trying to keep that family bond together between them because i'm very conscious of growing up and having some sort of um jealousy or animosity because one person like this like this gentleman has has mentioned about oh why have you praised my brother more or why have you given him more attention or stuff like that that develops that develops feelings of jealousy not not only between obviously the, the, right. the two brothers but also it's going to create a certain 
sort of animosity between yourself and the dad because it's going to be like, well, why does dad love him more, etc.? And then, oh, I don't like my brother because he's always getting and and when they're older, when you need to rely on them, when you need them to rely on each other, it doesn't really work out. Um, and the last thing is that I feel like the first boost of confidence comes from the parents in the sense that that's you very need true to be it you need to be able to praise them for the good work that they do and i want you know i'm not always gonna i don't like to always go back to my experience but that's all i know i can't think of a time that my dad has ever said that he's proud of me and that that really impacted me growing up till this day i still chase my dad's approval i will still message my dad or get in touch with my dad trying to show him something that i've done or achieved or whatever and it's still just because he's just not that sort of person to be very open and 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 and, and you know in praise and stuff um the best i'll get from him is oh th you know i expect that of my son as opposed to a oh, well done or you know good job or whatever it's like oh yeah you're my son of course i expect you to do well do you understand so for for, for all my life that really sort of annoyed me but because of that it also made me feel like growing up at school that i wasn't able and i wasn't i didn't have it in me to do certain things and i think it held me back a lot um in a lot of sort of competitive arenas because mm -hmm. I, I subconsciously felt like my dad didn't believe in me, which then made me not believe in myself, which made me maybe not even um, not bother to compete with people. And I was speaking to a brother recently about sort of this, um, where I kind of said on the off chance, I said to him, oh, do you know what? I'm always content with being second or third. I'm not really keen on being first. And he hated that. He was very pro about, you know, being competitive and being first and always trying to, you know, strive for the best. And I said, I don't like the attention of being in first place. And it feels like a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility. And I realized actually the subconscious behind that was because I had this, uh, I don't know, this complex about always trying to be first, but never reaching it and then never getting the actual congratulations or approval that I actually really wanted, you know, the, the, the sort of va validation is the word I'm looking for. Um, so I'm conscious of that with my kids and I'm conscious that, you know, if he does something that is impressive, that I want to really focus on praising that because then he's like, wow, do you know what? I'm really good at this thing. And then even at school, if somebody, if he does that same thing, so let's say it's, I don't know, uh, some sort of drawing, right? Let's say he's, we're talking about art. He draws something. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Do you know what? That's a really good thing that you've done there. That's incredible work, whatever. And he's really happy about himself. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. He goes to school. He does a bit, you know, the same sort of drawing. And then someone looks at him and says, oh, that's not really good. Or that's really bad. Or says something negative about it. My theory is that he won't, who does he value more in that situation? Initially, at least, when he's young, I'd like to think that he values his parents' opinion more. Definitely, he, definitely. Yeah. Especially his so dad. That, yeah, and then he'll say, do you know what? No, it's not. It is good. And then he'll try harder because he believes in himself already because I've instilled in him that belief because I've praised him and he'll bring it back. And I'll be like, no, that's really good. But it's not just empty praise. That's my main focus. It's not just like praising him for every single thing for empty reasons. But you can see two sides of the story here. And I think, obviously, with a lot of things... The right answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. it, it may be, it may be, Achi, that because of my upbringing and lack of that from my father, that I may be overcompensating and I could sway too far to the other side of the spectrum. And that is that is a concern of mine, that maybe I'm going to baby him too much or uh, coddle him too much because I felt like I might, I might not have had that in myself. Um, so, yeah, trying to strike that balance is really difficult. Yeah, I, I'm really intrigued to, to hear from the people in the comments in the live chat right now, um, because um, yeah, I think it's quite a fruitful, fruitful thing to discuss. This idea of uh, is is too much praise uh, good or bad, or is there such thing as too much praise? Um, and this idea of when praising one, should you feel like you've praised another? But and Muhammad, it sounds to me like you've got an amazing balance. While we while we wait for those comments to come in, um, mm. it sounds to me you have an amazing balance because uh, yeah. What it sounds like Simon Sinek is mentioning in this in this issue of millennials mm. is when praise is given when it's not due or when praise right. is given only because uh, praise was also given to like another sibling. And what you're saying is you wouldn't give praise. Um, well, A, well, A, you wouldn't give praise if it's not due. Uh, and, and secondly, that the praise by the parent is incredibly important. And I think you're right in that. I think the praise by the parent is incredibly important. And, and, and a lot of the stuff that you mentioned about your dad does relate a lot to me as well. And it mm. has a huge impact. Um, I've got this article here that says, uh, 
what Simon Sinek got wrong about millennials actually. So we'll have a read about oh, wow. that while we uh, okay. while we wait about while we wait for the comments. So uh, for those guys in the live chat, the the question here is, or or the things to add to the discussion. The discussion is um, talking about praise with children, especially when they're siblings, and uh, can we overpraise and will that be detrimental to their long term uh, life and career? So. Uh, the article by the different by thing by thin difference says before delving into what Simon Sinek got wrong about millennials, the thing he got right is there is a broader context to this generation. Many societal and technological trends impact this generation. Parenting approaches changed, social media and digital devices emerged quickly, and each of these elements changed people and how they live and work. I would add in several other contextual elements. Millennials entered the workforce during one of the most challenging economic times since the Great Depression. Corporate and leadership trust continues to decline and millennials saw the impact of this on their parents through layoffs and corporate greed. I think that's a very valid point. Growing up, I'd hear often many parents say um, stuff like, uh, uh, sorry, uh, growing up, I'd hear many friends in school say stuff like the word... Uh, uh, redundant you know i had the word redundant very early in my life such a big word when you're a child and mm. i remember asking my mom what does redundant mean she tried to explain to me i didn't really get it but i'd hear it a lot my mum got made redundant my, dad, my mom would be like oh did you hear about thingy like you hear yeah. her speaking to somebody saying oh they got made redundant and so perhaps that's that's great so here we go what simon S cynic got wrong about millennials surprisingly many of cynic's comments are big generalizations including millennial traits lower self-esteem highly self-absorbed narcissistic and entitled social media addictions imbalanced relationships job hopping lack of patience he often says that through no fault of their own after several repetitions cynic's rhetoric becomes condescending let's look at each key um thing in this area i'm not going to look at each key thing in the area but i will try and find the parenting uh benefit from it Um, oh, this was just way too long. But the, yeah. it says it, it concludes it by saying that uh, cynic. Oh wow, red, blue and red, huh? Uh, Simon Cynic does good. Did you was that by accident? I think so. It shouldn't be. <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> Simon Cynic um, does good work, and he has helped change leadership for the better. I guess it surprised me that you fell into vague generalizations. This seems like the opinion of one man. I, I'm still very much so like. I, I resonated a lot with what Cynic was mentioning to be honest personally mm. so mm. Uh, we should be concerned about the future of our leadership talent but we need to do it in a way that sets higher standards millennial sense of purpose is real and I see often in my interactions with them the challenge for older generations and generations is to find and encourage and protect this sense of purpose I do agree kind of like in, with you what you're saying as well about how important empowerment is don't mm. you like this there are, idea there are areas though look there are areas where I'd, I'd think that he would agree with me in the sense like there's some things i don't like to get involved in you ever see like it's going to be a weird analogy but you ever watch like those documentaries about like um you know wildlife and stuff and you see these animals getting attacked and all sorts of stuff but the, the guys filming never get involved right they just let the natural course take you know take its course and it's sort of like that with kids when you know if if, if suleiman is running around and falls over i don't like to be there and pick him up I try and encourage him to get up himself if he starts crying. I'm not going to be there to pick you up. Physical intervention, I don't like to do uh, because that gets them used to not trying to figure out or solve a problem themselves because um, they're not always going to be there. If he runs around in school and trips over and, you know, scrapes his knee, who, who's going to – where's the guarantee? Him, yeah. yeah, where's the guarantee that he's going to be there? And that's that's the same thing. That's, that's the psychology that's going to exist with him for the rest of his life. Oh, someone else will solve this problem for me. Someone else will, will get rid of this pain for me stuff like that. I don't want to be there as a problem solver, even though it's really hard to to stop yourself from doing so. I want them to sort of try and encourage them to use their ingenuity to figure it out. So anything that he's stuck in from something as, as basic as like, um, you know, something as basic as like a, a, a puzzle or a video game or whatever it is, no, figure it out, try again. You know, I'm not going to do it for you. Um, and that ideally, I hope, if um encourages him when he's older, when he's faced with real life problems, that he is he is going to be of the of those of the upper hand, where he's not just thinking, all right, who can help me out? Who can bail me out of this situation? Who's going to lend me money in this situation? Who's going to, do you know what I mean? Do this for me. Um, so that's that's probably what Cynic would probably argue in that in that arena. 
Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, we've mm. got some comments here, here then. So I've let them build up a bit so we can um, go through them. So Amuna says, um, I agree with Mohammed. Uh, I was always put down. Uh, I was always put out. I was always put down and it's affected me to this day, 24 years old. Uh, I always doubt myself and don't have much self-esteem or confidence. I wish my father praised me more instead of criticizing. Uh, look, I, 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 I think that's a massive, a massive point. Like to not mm. have praise and empowerment. I like the word empowerment more than praise in this, in this context, because yeah, yeah. praise is almost, it has, it's a very weak um, sentiment. It doesn't have much definition to it. it you, anyone can be praised for anything, but empowerment is like, when you see something amazing in your child and you empower them to carry on, you empower them to, to increase in it. Oh, that's amazing, man. And, and I think mm. that you're right. Like there's, the, we perhaps, empowerment of 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 children is something that would last and increase their self-esteem for such a long time um mm. she carries on and says um praising a child is so important where are we uh, praising a child is so important especially from parents or family because if they are deprived of that they will seek it elsewhere very good point but we haven't even discussed that the external factors mm. in which they would seek that that empowerment mm. uh, and the minute they get it elsewhere even if it's from a bad person, they will cling on to it. That's a great point. Um, it's also uh, Fahmida uh, says she agrees with Amuna. Amuna says it's also a lot of time. Uh, it's also a lot of the time why women or men fall into toxic relationships and don't leave because they cling on to that initial attention they maybe didn't get from home. Hmm. Mariam says yes, that's true. Amuna is leading the way with his comments, leading oh, the tribe and slowly picking up fans on the way. We see right. comments like, yeah, I agree, preach. Uh, but, but very valid points being raised. Uh, she carries on. It also leads them to believe when they are in a rock, uh, when they're in a rock relationship, oh, a rocky relationship perhaps, uh, oh, right. that, is all, that is all they are worthy of. Um, that, that is all that they are worthy of. I will never get better because they believe uh, they aren't good enough uh, since they were never told that they were amazing and deserving of good. Amazing point. Uh, Fizi adds, balance is important. Modern parents sometimes put their kids on a pedestal and that's that can be a problem. Older generation also never praise, no matter what you do. Worse, they mostly point out only the bad. That is hmm. incredibly, incredibly um, true and, and a massive point to highlight. Uh, thank you for that, Fizi. And Miriam says, yeah, I think uh, relationships with parents often... Uh, mirror future relationships whether it's in a good way or a bad way uh sandstorm agrees with who was here last week so thanks for the regular viewing sandstorm z uh says that's so true they end up being drawn to people who feel uh pr who feel provide a familiar who, who feel provide a familiar to the feelings their primary caregiver gave them good or bad the algerian then adds also, he'll only need you when he's young. So why not be there for him? That's a good point. Like right now, they're completely mm. dependent. Mm. Uh, Ismail, oh sorry, I, I looks like I've missed some points here. Uh, would you rather that might be in reference? That might yeah, be in reference was... to the, the physical sort of aid that I was talking about. There has to be a middle ground. We need to look at how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam raised the children household. True, he Ali he Ali he was merciful and overlooked their faults. At the same time, he encouraged and motivated them uh, to achieve their potential. I, mean, I, I think there was a, a point that I, I just quite out of this. I think it was what the Algerian said. He said, you only need you when you're young. Um, there was something uh, in that that I, that I felt um, was really valid. Would you rather... There's one that you? says, yeah, that's it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is my point. Oh, I was ha So I was having a discussion with my wife t just today. And it was about... It was about how like life is going, right? Like I was saying that when we were kids, things were a lot safer, and 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 I think that's like generational. Like when my mum was a kid, it was even safer than when when I was a kid, and because then I ended up speaking to my mum about the same issue. Uh, I rang her often, and we ended up chatting about the exact same thing. So I was saying about how safe uh, it was when we were kids, and she said, "Oh, even she said when I was a kid, it was even safer," and um, and don't get me wrong, there was like it was still fairly rough, but now rough has completely changed bro rough is mm. being stabbed and killed or even being shot um yeah. rough yeah. is rough is like being scared of your daughter going out because you're hearing about kidnappings and pedophiles that's the yeah. scary thing now and so i was i was speaking to my wife about this and i was saying like it's really weird because i've become that parent in my head where i'm thinking i i never want to be 
a part the person who doesn't ever let, for example, Zachary get public transport and stuff like that. Right. Because I don't want him to be like shelled and mollycoddled. But at the same time, I'm I'm going to be scared every time he's on the public transport because of how evil the people are becoming in this world and how mm. much crime is like uh, so prevalent. And um, and I was talking, I was saying that uh, you know at school there used to be kids who like they would never get the bus or the coach, and their parents would always pick them up and drop them off everywhere. And you you kind of saw those kids as like. Raw, like, don't your parents give you any independence? Yeah. And so I don't want my kids to be seen like that. I want them to be streetwise. I want them to have independence. But then where do you balance the two? Like having streetwise and independence with with their safety, especially in a growing mm. criminal world. Mm. I mean, I see it every day at work. Actually. I see these kids that are quote unquote streetwise. And, um, you know, I was that age once. And I, maybe I can sort of relate to uh, the way they're thinking and, and their confidence in what they're able to do but they do they don't realize in the slightest that they're being manipulated and exploited by people that are much older than them um to do things that um you know that to, that would take advantage of and you know one of the you know one of the easiest, easiest examples is like drug running for example getting in with the wrong crowd and then start drug dealing um for the for the older lot um stuff like that um and and maybe even adopting the culture of um you know gang violence or uh, carrying knives so and you know some may say that think that this is like an extreme sort of uh, example but unless you're out there and unless you're active in that community in your own communities you'll you'll see how prevalent it is um i think it's um i think we underestimate how many kids are involved in this sort of stuff how many kids um carry knives for example how many kids um feel like they have to to protect themselves and vice versa even those that aren't in them um, in poverty stricken areas where you could argue that society has pushed them to that direction um, you know, there are some kids from affluent families, from comfortable families, from comfortable communities, especially down here, um, where it isn't London, it isn't, you know, the capital, it's just kids trying to emulate some sort of culture um, that get themselves involved in that. And, and yeah, you, you do have a concern, like, not only for your kid's safety, but also, is my child going to be swayed by that and become one of those kids that want to, that, 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 that culture appeals to them? And it, it, I think, to be honest, it goes right back to what we were saying about what you know these these comments are saying how they will seek that attention and validation elsewhere a man wants to feel like a man and a boy wants to feel like a man but if the if the if the boy was never guided and praised and and encouraged and empowered to feel like a man and given responsibility from an early age then when somebody older than them comes to exploit them and gives them that responsibility of hey take this package and give it to so and so over there then yeah blessed you're you know you're 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 a real G now. Yeah. You're, you're running the show. That's it. You can be a you know a big man like us soon. And there's your responsibility. Here's your weed. Here's your cash. Here's your you know knife. Whatever it is, and that's it. You're running. You're running. You're running it now. You are the man that your father never was. Because look, and then you start looking at your dad and thinking, oh look, I see things now that you've never seen in a million years. I'm dealing with people that you've never dealt with in a million years. And that that sort of um, complex starts growing that you are a better or bigger man than your father ever was because you're dealing with more dangerous stuff and you're making more quick money and you're do you understand what i'm trying to say um and i think there was something missing there in that relationship between the father and son for example in those in, in those sort of circumstances i think um it, you know allah alam i can't speak for them well, because you mentioned i'm not in that responsibility. situation but... Yeah. You mentioned responsibility and we haven't spoken about that yet, but that's such an amazing point that I haven't thought of. The idea of not only empowering your child, but giving them a sense of responsibility displays trust, doesn't it? Like Definitely, yeah. That responsibility of giving them some cash and some drugs and, and whatever and saying, I'm entrusting you to to get this yeah. there. You feel they, that child then feels, or that person yeah. then feels responsible for it. So giving responsibility to your child in something that they'd be surprised that you'd give them responsibility in. What's Definitely. an example of What's an example of, of how you could do that? So I, I can't speak for my kids yet because maybe they're a bit too young to be responsible yeah. for certain things. But I remember when I did a lot of youth work in the Meshid, right, with a lot of these kids. So doing some sort of intervention in terms of we knew they were up to no good, but we tried, we were thinking outside of the box of how we can sort of bring them back. And what we realized collectively was that it was this issue of responsibility. They were getting, they were given responsibility by those older and more criminally inclined than they were and they looked up to that and they they wanted to be that but we gave them no responsibility in the masjid because when they'd come into the masjid we'd we'd rather see them leave as quickly as possible because they're just going to bring trouble in so actually it would be certain things in the masjid that we would say okay you uh, abdullah muhammad whatever 
this is your job now that you're in charge of this mm. and if it gets you know whether it's cleaning the masjid whether it's dealing with the charity whether it's collecting charity with all these little things right um and this is just in the masjid setting but imagine that at home imagine that it could be something as simple as like i don't know it's got to be something that um that the the, the that whole family that is responsible yeah but also the whole family can benefit from um because if you just give them a, a, sp- a responsibility that is solely theirs to use, for example, keep your room clean. Well, I don't want to keep my room clean. It's my room. I can have it messy if I want. But it has to be yeah. something that the responsibility covers the entire family's well-being. So if you were to say, you know, a, a very basic example, which we all would have to do when we were kids, is go and do the grocery shopping, right? Because that benefits the entire family. And that we're only going to eat tonight if you get all these things from the from the from the grocery store right so it's your responsibility to make sure the family's fed in this situation here's some cash this is what this is what we expect you to get go out and get it that kind of thing because it the reliance we are then collectively as a family relying on our son or daughter to to fulfill this 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 duty that has been thrust upon them that's the most basic level of responsibility in terms mm. of what we're able to give our kids but there are obviously going to be bigger things, and the older they get, there'll be even even better things. You know, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it before, Achi. You've seen it on TV. You've seen it in families. The dad throws a car key at their son, go park the car, or go take the car for a wash, or something like that. It's that entrustment and that trust of, you know. And Achi, imagine the feeling, Achi, right? You've always looked up to your dad's car, right? You, you don't have a car yourself, or you've, you've got a license, obviously. Let's forget, put the, push the law to the side for a second. But no, it's a hard thing for you to do. <laughs> but, but you're completely out of your comfort zone here. There's two criminology imagine, students on this chat <laughs> and you're telling us both to forget about the law. Imagine. Actually, you're treading imagine, on thin right? ice here. <laughs> how, how, how like gassed you'd feel. You've got your dad's car keys, right? And you'd even, you would even probably like take a little photo and send it to your mates. Look, dad's just given me the car <laughs> because there's that trust element there, but he's also giving you the responsibility to look after it. But once again, you know, you got to read. You got to read, be able to read your child and see how reckless they are because you don't want that car getting crashed. But there, that's that's it. It's it, responsibility is key. Actually. I think. Um, th- I think a lot of kids, especially that have swayed, don't expect to be trusted. So when you trust them with something, I think it comes as quite a surprise, and also they feel like a sense of honor that they have to fulfill this, that they're not going to betray this trust because nobody's ever trusted them with anything. No, but no, but you know, everybody's going to be. Um, dismissive of them or, or stating oh you know you're, you're bad you're no good you're this you're that everything's going to be negative negative the only people that are being any any bit of positivity to them are going to be those that are swaying them in the wrong direction you know and it, that's going to happen anywhere Achie. that's going to happen in school how does it start Achie? how does a kid get wrapped up with the wrong crowd at school it's because they're chasing some sort of attention from a popular naughty group of kids or something along those lines you know you've got to be able to feel confident in themselves and who they are um and feel confident that they don't need to prove themselves to anybody else apart from maybe their you know themselves and their parents or those that actually mean something to them not this not chasing this dream of like um uh, acceptance and, and validation from a crowd of people that actually are no good for them in, uh, to begin with you know I think there's also an element which is the element of like not making parenting too like um, shiny and squeaky clean. And what I mean by mm. that is like re- respecting the fact that your child is clever and more aware than you think. And um, mm. and so like it makes me think of like in school when we were in school, the teacher that would always be the cool teacher. Who would always be the cool teacher? It'd be that teacher that was a bit edgy. Like like mm. he would um, he would maybe be like. Uh, like for example we had this teacher in school right everyone got along with him he wouldn't take any like it wouldn't be he'd be serious like if you're in trouble with him you're in trouble but at the same time like when he's in a good mood and when every, everything's good like he was an english teacher like he would teach in a way that it's almost like he would say jokes that like normally are only jokes for adults. Now I don't mean in a yeah. dirty way, but I mean in a way where it's like like you're reading like To Kill a Mockingbird, and mm. you know he's talking about like this guy is going into this scary house, and he might just look up and be like, "Oh, what?" An-? Like he might even just be like, "Oh, what an idiot!" Like who, yeah. who does that? Do you know what I mean? And for a second, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's broken the fourth wall, and he's yeah, not treating yeah, you like a kid anymore, and it's like he's he's treating you like a friend. And what that does, bro, is that's like, oh, that's just cool, man. Like he says, idiot around yeah. us. Like it, yeah. so I'm not saying you use bad words around your kids, but 
But the opposite is, is that like, I remember there's one elder, there was like an elderly member that's in my like, um, in my um, extended family, right? Like an elder, an elder, right? Yeah. I remember one time when I was a kid still. So was, I definitely had, I didn't deserve any responsibility or anything. I was, I remember being a kid at this, at this time. I was probably very young. I don't remember how young at all, but I was, maybe I would say, I'll try and give it some context. Maybe I was around... 11 right. somewhere around there maybe right i'm trying to like historically make like a, a good a good guess now when we went to this elder's house and we were like drinking water he was i was like drinking with my water with one hand and he was like drink with two hands i like, make sure you drink with two hands and kind of telling me off for not drinking with two hands and at mm. that point i felt so micromanaged that i drunk with two hands but i never forgot i've never forgotten yeah. i almost felt like really belittled and patronized like come on bro I've like yeah, i know yeah. i'm a kid but you're treating me like a baby now and yeah. so i think that as parents we can easily because we know better than our children treat them like oh two hands uh okay mm. no and then like never like displaying your real adult side in front of them and all this kind of stuff and by doing that because you're parenting them in such a bubble wrapped manner it's not real it's not real life and and then then that cool teacher is cool because he like is a bit more normal is a bit more relaxed because yeah. the, the, the child's not dumb so i think perhaps maybe and i don't know because my child is too young for me to even experiment but perhaps like treating them a bit like a friend when they get past certain age has yeah, real definitely. benefits in it definitely and i think that's the aim back here that's like that's probably somewhere in your you know mind and my mind of why we tried to have kids um uh, the uh, got married essentially young and had kids uh, as young as we did um that was my at least my thinking i definitely wanted to because i had a, a, hu a huge age gap between me and my father i definitely wanted to have kids young so i can at least still be enthusiastic still be quite you know in the loop and stuff like that um but go but thinking of responsibility with my kids i've realized i've completely missed this but I've, i observe my wife and what she does with suleiman what she does with ids and stuff and i realized actually the biggest responsibility she's given Ilya, uh, suleiman is looking after ids with her um and I, I've, I've noticed it now. Actually, like Elias will crawl over to this computer, for example, start playing with wires. And so the man will go, run up to him and be like, no, Elias, you can't play with that. I pick him up and That's sort of amazing. like drag him back, stuff like that. Um, looking after him, actually, like thinking that he's responsible. Like, it's his responsibility to stop Elias doing anything too dangerous or, or or hurting himself. And even though he's still young and, and um, even further to that, um, my wife has really got him into like, cooking with her and stuff like that so if she's cooking something and she thinks that he can get involved then she'll do that she'll let him get involved because we're all going to eat from that and that's his responsibility and we you know if it's if it's nice we'll praise him and we'll we'll sort of he'll he'll feel really excited and i remember eating one of them and he's like oh i made that for you i made that for you it was like a cookie or something that he'd made and that was like wow that responsibility is now followed through he's produced something for his family and now the whole family is sitting there enjoying it and he feels a sense of pride and, and gratification that he's actually been part of that process you know yeah that's amazing man that that, that sense of responsibility even in a very small way my sister mm. does that just like it sounds like just like your 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 wife does my sister um older sister as i've mentioned numerous times before has has two boys and she does that as well. Like the older boy mm. does, and he, and then he does like now. It's got to the point where he himself teaches surahs to the younger boy. So when he learns oh, wow. surahs in Islamic school, she overhears them in their room at night time, and he's going like, "No, like it's not, it's not." Um, <laughs> like uh, he was teaching him the other day. I think uh, he's on surah uh, Quraysh or something. Uh -huh. So he's like, no, "It's, it's Yabudu." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's, it's so funny. Right? He's like. No, don't say that. It's, it's really funny. Like he's trying to teach him to read, but and then he's and then he's learning it and stuff. But um, I, I, there's no doubt that because she empowered him to, it's okay to yeah. to look after slash teach slash be the older brother to your younger brother. He then feels the responsibility that okay, I've learned this new surah, for example, I need to teach yeah. it um, when I get chance. So yeah, it's amazing to see. And um, and uh, I, I was going to say, we got we got the comments uh, popping off. And so before we end the podcast, look how quickly the hour went, Mohammed, is today. Oh, yeah. We spoke about oh, one yeah, topic the whole time, alhamdulillah. Uh, before good. we do end it, I, I, it's, it's, it's worth going over the comments. And, and if anybody has any points on what we've been discussing today, do um, chuck them in the comments now before we round up and we'll, we'll read them out. Um, 
Aziz or says uh, Islamically a child becomes responsible at a young age as like young or 11 uh, as like uh, 11 or 12 whereby they're liable for their salah zakat Ramadan and Allah has stipulated these responsibilities it's a very good point man like if if, if there's certain things that they're responsible like they're they're responsible for their iman like their, their salah mm. at that age that should show something in terms of like us handing them responsibility um, in other ways for uh, Fahmida says Okay She says From the time a child is born Until he separates from the family To establish a shared life with others He passes through two phases in his upbringing One, childhood From birth until the age of seven Is the time when the child is not well prepared For direct instruction and As he does not know the world And a second one is from the age of seven to the age of fourteen. In this time, when he in his intellect grows in preparation for intellectual activities, in this stage, the child can learn and be instructed. It, she says, in the first stage, the uh, instruction is to be indirect with commands uh, and psychological pressure, and in the second stage, the child should not be left free to behave and do so as he pleases, as his thoughts should not be ignored. Um, uh, uh, what Fahmida is talking about is also something that Sheikh Tim uh, Humble told us about and he said that there's this really famous saying that he said he can't attribute to like a hadith but he can mm. attribute but, but but has been attributed to like the um the like pious predecessors right that would be very common right. and what they would say is is exactly what Fahmida is saying that um from the ages of zero to seven uh you play with your child mm. and you just give them loads of love between 7 and 14, you discipline your child and you set the rules out for them. And between 14 onwards is when you just befriend them. Because at that point, they're not mm. going to listen to you if you try and implement rules and discipline. Yeah. That was all done between 7 and 14. At this point, you just befriend them so that they come to you if there's any issues that they're going through in life and stuff like that. And I think that's also a great place to to to, to end this week on. Um, Mohammed, I'll, I'll hand you over to you. Is there anything that you want to say? No, just barakallahu fikum for, for getting involved. I can see it's popping off. I've just opened it now. But that's nice, yeah. Akhya. I think a lot of people are talking to each other about it and they've got different views and stuff and different sort of um, perspectives. But, you know, like, you, like you've just ended it, um, it is always important to end it on the Quran and Sunnah and end it on, on uh, you know, the best of examples. And um, once again, you know, we are, we are new parents well, i still consider myself yeah. very new you know there's a lot that i don't know and of course there's going to be perspectives i might have and you might have that are completely off the mark um but i, th I think we we do sincerely in the left um try and draw from the example of the prophet uh, and uh, you know the pious predecessors and, the, and the, the prophets as a whole because there are a lot of stories of the prophets those with you know those that had children and those that we have the stories of them with their children and how they engage with their children um but yeah, but Ibn Allah, may Allah guide us to that which is best in this sort of arena of parenting because um, it is a big responsibility. Amen. It is something that we will be questioned about. And it is easy to forget that. You know, it is easy to forget that every single thing that we do has a consequence, um, positive and negative. Um, it's, and it's in this dunya and, and, and the hereafter um, for our children's dunya and our children's hereafter. And focusing on that and being aware of that um, is something we have to keep reminding ourselves, you know. But... That's what I'll end it with, bit in the left. Jazakallah khairan. And uh, thank you for the the colour contrast in the room halfway through the episode. It was great to see you in a uh, in a, in one colour, but then shift dramatically to a, a bright red. Do you know what? I've realised there's a psychology behind the blue and red, isn't there? Remember like all those movie yeah, posters? Yeah, it's like, the... it's like a versus. It's like we're nah. against each other. But let's, let's do but that from now on. No, no. We're we... brothers for you to be dead. Huh? We're competitively um, we're competing. That's the on the, the theory on, the, on our on our shared yeah. show. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, I mean, it would be maybe nice if you got some blue in there, and then we could just have like a whole blue. Okay. Can you? Me. Can we no, see what me. matches? Yeah, give us some options Let's, here. Oh, man. how about that? Oh. that looks nice. That looks that's so uniform. There we go. We we'll do that. Yeah, man. I mean, I can we'll switch. I feel, if you want, if you want to go back to the red, and you want to start competing here. Okay, yeah, I, I can, can always. Also, uh, I can do live. I can do. Oh, that's not gonna work. Oh, oh look. Oh, I've got I a disco show. I can always do a little. Uh, I've got the freshly grinded purple. But then oh. I can. Do you know? Shall I see my my favorite one is that blue that that you just saw. But I do like a little bit of. Uh, you can't really see it. But oh. It's a bit orangey. Mm, yeah, really you know beautiful. what? The camera doesn't pick up the colors very well. Um, look at us. We are absolute children right now. And I love yeah. it. I love every What's second. The red, the red. Here's my red. 
I mean, you can't spiral. see it very. There you go. No, I don't like red. I'm going back. Oh, don't tell me I permanently. Oh, I permanently adjusted my. I permanently adjusted my. Blue that I know also oh well. Oh, there it is. Because oh. I've got this blue saved in the settings. I specifically like this blue. This is just the TV for me. It's not really um, an independent light system. It's just the, oh. the TV has this feature. You know the TV. Yeah, so it because I've got nothing on the Very screen, fancy. it's giving me a, a blank screen. But what it usually does is it 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 throws the light of whatever is on the screen. So the color. A, wow. I'll send you a link. Dad Junior, Dad Junior should be must be doing a okay. Listen, this isn't the, uh, this isn't the the, the freshly grounded uh, technology show that's coming <laughs> soon, Nidler. <laughs> hey, there's there's a preview. There's an idea for you. We'll throw it about. No idea is a bad idea, they say, as they say. So, uh, <laughs> whatever I think about it. Uh, guys, thank you so much for uh, watching Dad's doing it this week. Inshallah, we'll see you again uh, sometime next week. Uh, as you know, we don't have a specific, specified day of Dad's doing mm. It's just as and when calendars align. Uh, mm. And that happened to be today. And Mohammed gave me an mm, 18 hour advance notice, I think. Yeah, I messaged you while I was on a night shift. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll always uh, do our best to let you guys know with as much advance notice as possible. Today, we gave you guys like an hour and a half advance notice. Uh, we'll see you guys, uh, inshallah, on the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as